good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Bank of Hawaii Corporation third quarter 2021 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star one on your telephone. I would like to hand the conference over to your speaker, Janelle Higa. Please go ahead. Thank you, Carmen, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On the call with me this morning is our Chairman, President, and CEO, Peter Ho, our Chief Financial Officer, Dean Shigemura, and our Chief Risk Officer, Mary Sellers. Before we get started, let me remind you that today's conference call will contain some forward-looking statements. And while we believe our assumptions are reasonable, there are a variety of reasons that actual results may differ materially from those projected. During the call, we'll be referencing a slide presentation as well as an earnings release. A copy of the presentation and release are available on our website, boh.com, under Investor Relations. And now I'd like to turn the call over to Peter Ho. Great. Thank you, Janelle. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, I'll lead off with a little commentary on what's happening here in the uh, Hawaii marketplace. <clears throat> I'll then, <clears throat> as is our custom, turn the call over to Dean, who will fill you in on the financials for the quarter, generally a pretty clean, good quarter for us, and then he'll turn the call over to Mary uh, to touch on credit items, and then we'd be happy to take your questions. Um, so leading off, um, talk a little bit about the uh, economy here in the islands. Um, got hit pretty hard uh, late in the summer with the Delta variant, and uh, our forecasters over at the University of Hawaii uh, really had anticipated um, a pretty meaningful impact uh, to employment uh, in the state. And, and we were actually kind of surprised to see uh, unemployment come out just recently at 6.6%. So continued uh, positive downward uh, trending in unemployment uh, here in the state. Uh, well, like I said, a bit of a surprise. And then we go to the next page. Um, I think what's happening is uh, the 920 forecast. Uh, you see an elevated level of uh, forecast unemployment for uh, 22 and 23. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next forecast, but at this point, it's looking like uh, employment's in a bit, a bit of a better space than what we had, uh, what we were all thinking coming out of our most recent Delta surge. Uh, turning to the real estate market, um, like many places in the country, uh, if not in the world, actually, uh, real estate continues to be hot. Uh, sales prices, median sales prices for single-family homes up uh, 19%, uh, up 7.4% for condominiums uh, that September on September, uh, and then inventory levels continue to trend downward. So uh, inventory levels for single-family homes here in the islands are now, uh, or here on Oahu actually, are now down to 1.2 months and uh, 1.8 months for condominiums. Um, air, uh, daily arrivals, uh, really visitors into our marketplace. Uh, I think that this is uh, an interesting chart. It shows uh, a couple of things here. Um, what it shows is the, um, uh, the ramp up, if you will, in, uh, in uh, visitor count into the islands uh, really was on a pretty nice trajectory uh, for most of 2021. Uh, right up until about July, uh, you see uh, from the chart that, that we have up here that basically uh, we uh, had comped back to 2019 levels by the end of July. Uh, and, and, and mind you, that was uh, accomplished really with only uh, one of our two primary markets in place. So uh, lots of uh, supply in. From the, uh, from the North America market, mainly the United States, uh, both East and West coasters, and really not much in the way of uh, demand in from uh, Asia as that marketplace uh, continued to work through its, its vaccine and, and uh, infection protocols. Um, then the Delta hit and um, a number of policies put in place and a pretty meaningful downturn in, uh, in visitor traffic, you see post, um, really kind of post-August. Uh, so we're in a bit of a repositioning phase, I think, at this point. Uh, it feels like, um, and, and talking to some of the hoteliers in town, that the winter should be a pretty good season for us again. And so I think absent any 
uh, recurring surge, you know, here in the islands or nationally speaking, I think we should be in for kind of a resumption of that upward uh, trend in arrivals. Uh, but we'll, we'll see we'll see how this all plays out. Switching to the um, COVID situation, um, I mentioned we, we went through a pretty meaningful spate um, with uh, with the Delta variant uh, in late, you know, kind of mid late summer. Uh, things have gotten quite a bit better here in the islands. So you see here on uh, this chart that we're trending, you know, towards the bottom um, of the of the uh, country in terms of number of infections, which is a good thing. And then as it relates to vaccination rates, um, we're now at 70, almost 71 percent of the total population fully vaccinated. That's a very good number, I think, by national standards. Um, and I think the, the interesting number is that if you look at the number, the percentage of, of people vaccinated here in the islands uh, that are eligible to be vaccinated, that number is now actually into the 90 plus percent range. And so uh, hopefully we'll see if, um, if uh, the under 12 year old population uh, gets authorization to be vaccinated. Assuming that happens, uh, I think we would anticipate a very, very high percentage of our local uh, state of Hawaii population to be vaccinated in the not too distant future. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and turn the call over to Dean who will update you on our financials for the quarter. Dean? Thank you, Peter. Growth from core customers remained solid in the third quarter. Core loans net of PPP waivers increased by $276 million, or 2.4% link quarter, and $542 million year-over-year, or 4.8%. Waivers on PPP loans have accelerated, and balances declined by $245 million in the quarter. Our strong deposit growth continued. Core customer and operating account balances grew by $613 million link quarter, Offsetting this growth was a reduction in non-core public time deposits of $289 million. As a result, total deposits increased by $324 million, or 1.6% link quarter, and $2.8 billion, or 16% year-over-year. Our strong and stable deposit base remains a readily available source of liquidity for continued growth and income. Excess liquidity is being deployed in high-quality, low-risk investments that can easily be converted into funding if needed, while providing current income and mitigating margin pressures. Our balance sheet's asset sensitivity positions us well for rising rates and greater net interest income. Our strong core deposits and low loan-to-deposit ratio of 59% will allow us to lag rate increases while maintaining a significant funding source for continued growth. Our mix of floating and adjustable rate loans, ample monthly cash flow, and cash balances represent significant flexibility and greater income potential in a rising rate environment. Net income for the third quarter was $62.1 million, and earnings per common share was $1.52. Net interest income in the third quarter was $126.8 million, up 2.7% link quarter and up 2.1% from the third quarter of 2020. Included in the third and second quarter's net interest income were $5.9 million and $3.8 million, respectively, of accelerated loan fees from PPP loan waivers. Adjusting for PPP loan forgiveness, the third quarter's net interest income increased by $1.2 million, or 1% link quarter, as the lingering impact from lower interest rates was offset by strong core loan growth and deployment of liquidity. We expect these trends to continue and expect core net interest income will increase by approximately 2% in the fourth quarter, excluding the PPP loan waivers. As Mary will discuss later, we recorded a negative provision for credit losses of $10.4 million this quarter. Non-interest income totaled $41.4 million in the third quarter, compared with a reported $44.4 million in the second quarter. Included in the second quarter were gains of $3.7 million from the sale of investment securities. Adjusted for these gains, the third quarter non-interest income increased by approximately $700,000 from higher deposit fees and swap transaction fees. We expect non-interest income will increase to approximately $42 million in the fourth quarter, 
from increase, increasing deposit fees, service charges, and other transaction fees as we emerge from the negative impact from the Delta variant and further reopening of the economy. Non-interest expense in the third quarter totaled $96.5 million, approximately unchanged from the second quarter. The third quarter's expenses included charges of $3.8 million related to the early termination of repurchase agreements and $1.2 million of severance expenses. These were offset by a $6.3 million benefit from the sale of property. The termination of the repos allowed us to reduce our non-core funding, free up capital, and increase net interest income. Adjusting for these items, expenses were higher by $1.3 million link quarter, primarily due to a very successful marketing program initiated during the quarter that contributed to the quarter's strong loan growth. The strong loan growth also led to an increase in variable expenses. The marketing and variable expenses represented $1.2 million of the link quarter expense increase. Expenses are projected to be between 98 and 99 million for the fourth quarter, or approximately 391 million on a reported basis and 388 million adjusted for one-time items for the full year. When evaluating our expenses over a longer period and comparing with the full year 2021 estimate to the pre-pandemic year of 2019, we continue to demonstrate expense discipline. Expenses on a reported basis increased at an annualized rate of 1.5%, which was well below the rate of inflation of 2.4%. More importantly, our current expense levels and normalized expense run rate already include expenses related to the significant innovation investments that are resulting in balance sheet growth and core expense efficiencies. In 2019, the level of our investment spending has increased by $17 million, and we're realizing annual savings of $8 million. <clears throat> our return on assets during the third quarter was 1.07%. The return on common equity was 17.08%, and our efficiency, <coughs> excuse me, our efficiency ratio was 57.38%. Our net interest margin in the third quarter was 2.32%, a decline of five basis points from the second quarter. The decline in the margin in the third quarter reflects the ongoing impact from the strong deposit growth, partially offset by core loan growth, deployment of liquidity, and PPP loan waivers. Excluding the impact of further PPP loan waivers, we expect the margin will increase by low single digits in the fourth quarter over the third quarter, primarily due to continued loan growth and stable interest rates. Our capital levels re remain strong and will position and, and well positioned to support continued growth. Our CET1 and total risk-based capital ratios were 12.02% and 14.72% respectively, with a healthy excess over the minimum well-capitalized requirements. During the third quarter, we paid out $28 million, or 46% of net income, available to common shareholders and dividends, and $1 million in preferred stock dividends. We repurchased 241,000 shares of common stock for a total of $20 million, and finally, our board declared a dividend of 70 cents per common share for the fourth quarter of 2021. And I'll turn the call over to Mary. Thank you, Dean. Customer loan balances on deferral are down 95% from their peak to 0.8% of total loans. As you'll recall, we elected to partner with our customers through this unprecedented event to provide additional relief, primarily through principal deferrals on low margin real estate. 100% of the loans remaining on deferral are secured, with our consumer deferrals having a weighted average loan to value of 70% and our commercial deferrals having a weighted average loan to value of 37%. 100% of the commercial loans on deferral continue to pay interest, and our return to payment performance remains strong, with less than 1% of these customers delinquent 30 days or more. Credit metrics remain strong and stable in the second quarter. Net charge-offs were 1.2 million, or four basis points, flat for the link period. Non-performing assets were 20.6 million, or 17 basis points, up one basis point from the second quarter. 
Loans delinquent 30 days or more were 28.3 million, or 23 basis points at the end of the quarter, down two basis points for the linked quarter. And criticized loan exposure totaled 2.34% of total loans, up 17 basis points for the quarter. As Dean noted, we recorded a negative provision for credit losses of 10.4 million. This included a negative provision to the allowance for credit losses of 11.3 million, which with net charge-offs of 1.2, reduced the allowance to 167 million. 1.39% of total loans and leases, or 1.42% net of PPP balances. The decrease in the allowance reflects the most recent Euhero economic outlook and forecast for our market, coupled with our credit risk profile. The allowance does continue to provide for the uncertainty and potential downside risk inherent with the pandemic. I'll now turn the call back to Janelle. Thank you, Mary. This concludes our prepared remarks. We are now happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. And as a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw the question, press the pound or hash key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. We have a question from Andrew Leach with a Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Andrew. I um, just want to talk on the, the, the margin guide here to be uh, up slightly. Does that include any improvement in the earning asset mix? And you continue to have pretty good deposit inflows. Just kind of curious how you see the, uh, the level of cash shifting around here. Yeah, I, I think the uh, – well, the guidance uh, assumes a little bit of a balance sheet growth and as well as uh, continued loan growth and a little bit more of uh, in, um, investing of the excess liquidity. So that's how we got to the, how I got to the number. Okay, got it. Because it looks like you've, over the last few quarters, you've been pretty, uh, I wouldn't say aggressive, but you've been consistent with uh, adding to the securities portfolio. So is that still uh, the, the plan? And uh, I guess with the steepness of the yield curve, are you even more inclined to uh, to add to the book? Uh, we are, but the, keep in mind that uh, the way we've handled the investment portfolio in the past is it's really, a, uh, because it's a kind of a storage of liquidity for us, we tend to adjust the balances based on deposit and loan growth. So it would kind of be the net outcome from both of those uh, lines. Got it. Okay, that, that's very helpful. Uh, and then on the expense front, uh, with your guide of 98 to 99 million, is that a good run rate to use going in the, into next year? Um, but then maybe layering on some uh, merit increases and then the, the seasonal uh, payroll taxes in the first quarter. Um, it'll serve as a base. Um, we do have those items that you've mentioned, but we intend to continue to uh, make um, strategic investments, um, especially in our um, innovation kind of area like we've seen in the past. Got it. Um, okay, very helpful. Thanks for taking the question. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Our next question comes <clears throat> from Jeff Rulis with DA Davidson. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning. Hey, Jeff. Question for maybe for Mary, and, and I don't want to get – too into the weeds here, but trying to get a sense of that provision recapture. I, my my guess is the provision and reserve levels are are more um, led by uh, like unemployment projections, correct? Versus uh, less about what you're actually seeing the six six number that you quoted. But is that correct that it's more on the projections that that leads that number? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I, I guess intuitively, if if uh, projections more closely align with lower actuals, we we could read that continued recapture is is possible. I suppose it's oversimplified, but um, you've is that got fair? it. Okay, yes. got it. All right. Um, thank you. And Peter, uh, just on the on the loan growth side, I mean it, it continues to be very strong. I think in quarters past, you've done a You've done a thorough job of sort of pegging by segment where you think you have some tailwinds, some that might have some some headwinds. But just if you wouldn't mind kind of rattling through the, the book and, and where you see in terms of not only Q4 but 22 where 
where you're optimistic and, and where some areas that, that may come in. Sure. Um, so we had good growth in both commercial as well as consumer on a core basis, Jeff. Uh, CNI, actually, if you, if you net out the PPP uh, out of CNI, um, that was up 5.4% um, um, on a linked basis for the quarter, really driven by, you know, we've made some, some, um, some great investments in people over the past couple of years, um, and, and those individuals have helped us build market share in, in, in a few market, sub-markets here in the islands. Uh, so I think CNI um, has an opportunity to grow into 22, uh, probably not at the 5% linked level, but, you know, a, a, a reasonably healthy growth rate there. Uh, CRE was up 1.7% in the quarter on a linked basis. And uh, you know, we, think, we think there's um, a good amount of room in that space as well, both, both in our granular, uh, what we call our fast track product, which is you know, smaller uh, commercial mortgages uh, to smaller investors and, and mom and pop types, uh, but also in the institutional space. Uh, I think clearly the, um, the market has, has, has recognized the durability of, uh, of Hawaii assets at the institutional level, and uh, we're seeing um, kind of renewed interest after you know, taking a pause through the pandemic. Uh, construction, I think, uh, should be strong as well. Uh, that was up pretty nicely in the quarter, uh, and really led by uh, hopefully affordable housing output, because you know, uh, goodness, we, we certainly need that here in this marketplace. Uh, switching over to the um, consumer side, uh, Resi was um, was. But about flat for the quarter on a, on a linked basis. Uh, production was down about 30% as rates, um, as rates started to pick up. Um, but the good news is that was offset by really great uh, production in just about all of our other consumer categories. So Heckle was up very smartly. Uh, Indirect even was up despite the inventory challenges of that, uh, of that industry. And our other consumer, which is basically installment, um, was up uh, 36 million or just under 10 percent uh, for the quarter on a linked basis. Really driven by we, we kind of restarted that program as we took a bit, you know, pulled back a bit on that programming uh, through the pandemic. And so I think I think that was uh, that created some um, some pent up demand in the book, uh, but still a very good result. And, and I think the the other interesting thing on the consumer side is uh, we're seeing a good uptake in our digital channels. So. Uh, 18% of our production for the quarter was uh, was through our digital channels, up 62% year on year. Okay, uh, appreciate it. A lot of detail. Sounds pretty pretty good momentum into and in 22, I suppose. Maybe one last one, yeah. just um, Dean, um, and maybe maybe it's Dean's question. Just the the PPP. Could we kind of assume that's largely cleaned up by year end? Is that um, is that fair to say? Yeah, we, we expect the fourth quarter to pay off um, most of the what's remaining, but we also do expect some might carry over, but not that material amount. Okay, thank you. Yeah, take care. Thank you. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, simply press star 1 on your telephone to get in the queue. We have a question from Laurie Honsaker with Compass Point. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Good morning. Um, can you just refresh us on how much in PPP fees are actually remaining? Yeah, we have uh, approximately 7.7 .7 remaining. Okay. And then I just want to make sure I heard you right. It was $5.9 million that was reflected in this quarter? That was the accelerated fees. The, you, if, if right, you, the forgiveness. Right. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm if I'm stripping that out, so your margin then was 221 relative to 230 x PPP gains last quarter. I guess can you can you help us think a little bit about your your comments about potential margin widening, and also maybe. The FHLB borrowings that were prepaid in the quarter, when were they repaid and how much and um, what were those costing? Thanks. Okay. Um, let me take that um, second one first on the uh, repos. It was towards the end of the quarter. 
Um, the approximate rate was uh, about 2.6%, 2.4%, sorry, 2.4%. Um, and then the, in terms of the margin, I think I get to the same numbers that you did on the PPP waivers. Um, liquidity uh, impacted us um, quarter over quarter by about uh, 11 basis points, and then our growth and deployment of um, assets added back about two basis points. Okay, great. And then just, just one last question around that. Do you anticipate doing any borrowing prepays in this coming quarter, or how are you thinking about that? Um, I think it will depend on the situation. I mean, we've done these opportunistically. Um, when when it looked uh, positive from, you know, various fronts, we, we will do it. Um, but... Uh, right now, I guess nothing planned yet for the quarter. Okay, great. And then, sorry, just two more ones for me. Just want to make sure I've got this right. So the preferred this quarter was 1.006 million. Next quarter, we'll see the full impact. That'll be 1.969. Am I am I doing the math on that right? Yes. For the fourth quarter, you'll see approximately two million in preferred dividends. Two million. Okay. Perfect. And then just last one for me, how should we think about tax rate going forward? Uh, for the fourth quarter, uh, estimate is about 24%. Okay. And what about for next year, X whatever is happening in Washington? How should we think about that? Um, I, I think for now, a 24% is also a good number. Okay. Perfect. Thanks for taking my question. Thanks, Lori. Thank you, and I'm not showing any further questions. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and for your continued interest in Bank of Hawaii. Please feel free to contact me if you have any additional questions or need further clarifications on any of the topics discussed today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating, and you may now disconnect.